Coming to you now from the heart of California's San Joaquin Valley, we're en route to the newest campus of the University of California, UC Merced, our host for this edition of State of Minds. Good evening, I'm Linda Schacht and I'm sitting here in the Lantern Cafe. It's a coffee shop on the first floor of the Collegian Library. When we were last here, UC Merced was under construction. It was hard to imagine that just two years later we would find such a vibrant and exciting campus community. And just what is it that makes this place so special? It is the students, of course. There are some 1,200 of them enrolled this year. We talked mostly with those from what they call the Pioneer Class. That's the group that enrolled in the fall of 2005 as the very first undergraduates at UC Merced. And you'll be interested to know that this is the first new American research university of the 21st century. Here's Carlo from New York and Monica from Orange County. Christina comes from Merced. My parents got here from Mexi Mexico about 20 years ago, 20, 21 years ago, and um, they have no college, and we had no idea what college was. So for me, this is new. And everything I've encountered, it's been kind of on a first, you know, me going in first, so. But it's been good. And Rodney from Virginia, he thought long and hard about his college years. Yeah. Um, I always knew that I wanted to come to the University of California. I knew there was a lot of opportunity here for me. And it was really just a matter of um, figure out, figuring out which UC campus fit me the best. And so when I heard about UC Merced, I was so excited about a new opportunity like this for me to go in, dive in, be a pioneer, be a leader on campus. And it's been an amazing experience so far. And I couldn't have made a better choice. Already, I kind of wanted to try something new. That's my re main reason for going out to California. So then, when I saw the opportunity to help build a new school, something that was going to be there, I mean, something that's 100% new, something that I would go to and I would be the like pioneer, I found that it was very appealing, <laughs> honestly. With a faculty-student ratio of 1 to 12, these students say it's easy to get to know their professors here. You have to work together. The teachers force us to do that, especially in discussion. You're not going to just sit there and be a person in the corner. You can't do that. You're going to be interacting with students and teachers, and your teachers will call on you and be like, okay, so what's going on? You know, it's fun. I mean, I have a good time in class. I'm the loud one in class. I have a good time in class. <laughs> Most of the professors are on first name basis with the students, which is very unique, I believe. Um, I've done research. I'm in my third semester with a, a professor from Stanford. And she's like a second mother to us and uh, real warming. We went to her house yesterday for a barbecue for an uh, end of the year party. Having that, that support with my faculty, you know, where they know you one-on-one -on, -one on a first name basis, um, having that support system amongst my friends, my peers, you know, we all know each other. And so that's just really helped me transition being so far away from home. And I think that's been probably the best experience out of all of it. And there's also the social life. A lot of UCs, there's so many students that it's hard to get to know people, but here it's so small and cozy that like, it's easier for people to get to know people. College in general, people are very willing to be friendly, but on top of that, our school is smaller than most other schools. And then also, we're all coming with the same idea of being new and pioneer, so we all really wanted to be like a family and be very tight-knit. Outside of class, I do dancing, I do Hawaiian dancing. I am also start part of the group here at UC Merced. I also do the newspaper here. And we do have like, you know, our off-campus parties, but they're not too crazy, like just gatherings, having fun, going to the movies. The mall, which we wish it would stay open longer, but we just hang out. I mean, we have, I live at Granville, so we have like the pool, we have pool parties, and just have fun, just have a good time, relax. Our first story tonight takes us to UC Irvine and back in time to the late John Lennon. Peter Rothenberg reports. It was the late 1960s and the Vietnam War was raging. John Lennon, one of Britain's most famous citizens, 
was an outspoken opponent to the American involvement in the war. Thanks to John Wiener, a professor of history at the University of California, Irvine, we now know the true story of the U.S. government's attempts to silence John Lennon as a leader in the anti-war movement. Wiener wrote two books on Lennon and was the historical consultant on the documentary the U.S. versus John Lennon. Well, Lennon's transformation from the lovable mop top to the uh, enemy of Richard Nixon is a fascinating story, and it's really the story of the 60s, and he kind of exemplifies what, you know, a million young people were going through. Shortly after that, that uh, he and Yoko moved to New York in the fall of 1971, and he's eager to hook up with the leaders of the anti-war movement in the United States. He knows about Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Bobby Seale, the Black Panther. They have a lot of ideas. The plan for a national tour headlined by Lenin that would do this kind of radical anti-war organizing and voter registration. They did a trial run in Ann Arbor, Michigan in December 71. Apathy, isn't it? And that we can do something. This song I wrote for John Sinclair. John Sinclair was a local anti-war organizer and leader in Michigan who had, was serving uh, a 10-year sentence in the state penitentiary for selling two joints of marijuana to an undercover cop. It ain't fair, John Sinclair, in the staff all breathing hell. When John Lennon was killed in 1980, John Wiener filed the Freedom of Information Act request for all of the Lennon FBI files. When most of the documents were withheld, Wiener filed the lawsuit against the FBI that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Wiener eventually won the case, and after 25 years, he received the last of the FBI files in 2006. The first items in the John Lennon FBI file of any significance is the report from an FBI undercover agent at the John Sinclair concert. So here's the Freedom Rally, University of Michigan, December 10th, 1971. The next page, here it is. It ain't fair, John Sinclair in the stir for breathing air. This was one of the documents that was withheld on the grounds that releasing it would endanger the national security. This isn't anything that the FBI should be investigating. This isn't anything that threatens the national security of the United States. This is political expression. Well, the part of the story that had been in the news in 1972 uh, was that the INS began deportation proceedings against Lennon that spring. In, I was convicted in, in of England. possession in England and fined a hundred dollars, I mean a hundred pounds. Is this an obstacle? I was told to plead guilty that rather than, rather than get into trouble. Is that the obstacle to your staying here? Actual. Yeah. The proposal that Lennon should be deported uh, doesn't come from the Immigration Service, just routinely enforcing then existing law. It comes from Senator Strom Thurmond, a prominent Republican conservative. He wrote a letter to the Attorney General John Mitchell and also to other White House officials outlining the plans Lenin was making with his friends for this national concert tour that would register young people to vote. And the Strom Thurmond letter concludes deportation would be a strategic countermeasure. Will you now stop speaking out against the war because of no, this? No, uh, nothing will stop me. And uh, whether I'm here or wherever I may be, I'll always have the same uh, feelings and say, say what I feel, you know? So did the president know, well, we have this quite frightening document from the director of the, of the FBI to the whole chain of command, starting with the attorney general, the Secret Service, the director of the CIA, the Secretary of State, the Vice President, and the President. All, all of them are receiving this. It's a summary about demonstrations 
uh, plan for the Republican National Convention. And it says, you know, uh, according to a source, uh, Beatles singer John Lennon is going to have something to do with this. Indeed, he doesn't go to the, to, the, to the Republican National Convention to demonstrate. And then in November, Nixon is reelected in a huge landslide. Just a couple weeks later, the end of 72, there's an entry in Lennon's FBI file saying they're putting the file on inactive status. They're closing the Lennon file. I interpret this as, you know, we got Nixon reelected. We, we neutralized Lennon, that's the word they've used before. There's no need to keep this Lennon thing going any longer. So the FBI clearly had uh, a political purpose in mind and only a political purpose in mind. And it wasn't until 1974, Watergate unravels, Nixon resigns, the INS throws in the towel and gives him a green card. Lennon died just six years later. But thanks to the work of John Wiener, his plea for truth was answered. I'm Peter Rothenberg, reporting from UC Irvine. If you'd like to check out those FBI files yourself, just log on to John Wiener's website at LennonFBIFiles.com. I'm now in the quad right in front of the Science and Engineering Building that you can see behind me. In just a couple of weeks, the entire campus community will come right here for commencement. That's when 77 students will receive their degrees from UC Merced. And one of them will be Emily McKeegan. I'm so excited for being here, and I'm so excited to be graduating from here because I really have been a part of something that's brand new, something that's going to affect future generations and affect future UC students. And, um, the UC community in itself and people are going to go, they'll ask me, Merced, where's Merced? And they don't quite understand what UC Merced is and it gives me an opportunity to promote the university by talking about it and, um, and people ask me all the time, so do you like it there? And I go, oh, yeah, it's great. If you have the opportunity to go to Merced, go to Merced, you will not regret it. Our next story highlights the real importance of research universities, just like this one, to the health and the economy of California. Larissa Brannan reports on work that's being done at UC's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources to prevent E. coli from contaminating our food supply. In 2006, more than 200 people were sickened and at least three people died after eating spinach contaminated with the E. coli bacteria. The deadly outbreak was traced to a San Benito County, California farm, and the source has since been determined to be from either cattle or wildlife. To prevent future outbreaks in food crops, growers and processors are working with University of California scientists to study the biology, ecology, and possible sources of E. coli in agricultural systems. We're now going to take a look at livestock, wildlife, and movement of E. coli. We want to know what the sources are, what the potentials are, what the risks are with them, and then how does it, if, if they are a source, how does it move? Larson is one of several university advisors collaborating with the United States Department of Agriculture on a four-year $1.7 million research initiative. Robert Mandrell of the USDA's Agricultural Research Service is co-leader of the project. Each of the team members has uh, expertise very appropriate to this work. Our laboratory, for example, is going to be intensively involved in testing the samples, isolation of uh, pathogens if they're there, and then also fingerprinting those pathogens by a variety of techniques and one relatively new technique, um, creating a database of, of strains and uh, fingerprints. Knowledge is going to be important because there, there may be things that aren't as much of a risk as we think they are, and there may be others that have just been undiscovered that are more of a risk than we know. Our first year is outreach, planning, meeting with the cattlemen and other groups to try to get things set up, get cooperators and producers to work with us, and then this coming winter is when we'll actually start the sampling and we'll be doing that for another three years and hopefully be able to get some answers. Ultimately, we want to make sure the food is safe for the public. 
So we want to try to get some answers, what is really going on, so that we can give some really good sound science, so that the food is safe, but so is the industry, and, and people's lives can continue, and ranchers can continue, and farmers can continue, so that's what we're after. As for consumers concerned about their risk of E. coli contamination from fresh produce, researchers emphasize that deadly outbreaks are rare. It's an incredibly low percentage of the time that this would ever be a risk. So all you have to think about is how much produce you're eating that you, you don't have a problem. Having said that, um, certainly the produce industry is, is more sensitive to this even than any of us probably because they're the ones that are really affected by it. So they know that even if it's a low uh, probability event, another one, because of the media attention, really creates problems for everyone. In Monterey County, I'm Larissa Brannan. I'm now in the reading room. It's up on the fourth floor of the library, and it is obviously a beautiful and quiet place to study or to gaze out the windows at the wide open spaces that surround this campus. It's time now to go further north up the Central Valley to UC Davis, where a senior in engineering is opening a whole new world for a group of local high school students by teaching them to compete. Andy Fell explains. Among the rookie teams for this robotics competition at UC Davis are some underdogs, such as largely Hispanic Woodland High School and their robot Wolfie but they're getting some help from Latino engineering students at UC Davis. No, it'll turn on. The problem is that... UC Davis senior Lorenzo Rocha has been mentoring the team. In six weeks, they are getting something that they probably will not get in any other club in high school. Competitions like this helped Rocha when he was in high school in South Central Los Angeles. I started working in Woodland High School as a tutor in the Community Service Learning Center. Well, once I heard about the, uh, the opportunity that FIRST Robotic brings, I immediately thought about those students that, you know, that don't know what to do and they're of my background. FIRST Robotics is a national competition founded by Segway scooter inventor Dean Kamen. 30,000 students at 1,300 high schools take part in regional competitions like this one at UC Davis. Good morning, Winners go on to a national tournament in Atlanta. Well, the thing that's great about FIRST Robotics is that it really encourages uh, high school students to really learn about what engineering is all about. They've got six weeks to design, build, test, retest, redesign a robot, and then to compete at venues like this. In the pits, the Woodland team tackles some last-minute glitches. It was the, the cables, the cable, all the cables. The cables all along. All of them. Oh, man. Standards are high. We basically rewired the entire robot. Why on earth did you do that? Uh, because the uh, inspector told us the wires were too messy and we wouldn't ask a beat unless we rewired it. They're learning to think on their feet. They're th learning to think fast and to solve problems quickly. They are Woodland Robotics. All right, back up, guys. Six robots compete at a time. Having trouble with their robots on, Woodland use their robot to block opponents. Yeah, really good. A lot of stuff went wrong with the robot, but we just got in everybody's way, so that's kind of the goal. <laughs> when we came here, there were gloves and a little note from the FemBots of Sacramento welcoming us. Uh, when we had a problem with cables, the uh, other teams came forward. When we needed programming help, the guys were right here. It's, it's, it's just fantastic. FIRST Robotics is helping the students think about careers. I want to be um, a, a mechanical engineer. I learned like how tons of things work, like the motors, the pneumatics, a lot. They start thinking about going not only to a four-year college, but going to a college that is an, uh, interested in engineering. They think of uh, basically making connections with industry. And it's a valuable experience for the mentors too. I think it's very important if you don't go back and help out the community that helped you, then it's not worth it. Because what good is it for me to come to college and to not go and give back for future generations to come and come to college and do math and science engineering? It allows me to remember when I was in high school 
allowed me to think back to why I decided to get, go into engineering. Ever since high school, I knew I wanted to be an engineer because of a program like this. They see these are kids who have hung in there and are almost uh, professionals in their own right. Back in the competition, Woodland is doing well, but having some technical problems. Like right now, we won two competitions and lost three and just the recent competition, our chain broke off and we're trying to fix it right now. Uh, right now we're in the finals as alternates, so if two robots have the tendency to fail, then we're going in. Yeah, it just kind of stopped everything. Woodland High doesn't make the final rounds, but they do finish 18th in a field of 39, top of the rookie teams. A lot of people have been impressed with this team. They are now encouraged to work a lot harder next year because they want to be out there right now. Are you going to be back next year? Yeah, definitely. They're already talking about messing with motors, messing with, messing with structures, messing with pneumatics to try to figure out how to get everything as precise as possible. You know, I found that students who have dreams finish school and these kids uh, have seen what it, what it looks like. So they now have a better dream. This would not be possible without so the support of the community. And communities have to get behind this. They're definitely our future. A lot of kids in high school decide to go to college. Some of them decide to go into engineering, but they're still unsure why they want to do it. These kids, I'm sure they'll have a reason why. Reporting in Davis, I'm Andy Fell. Some of those high school students you just saw up at UC Davis, they just might want to apply here to Merced once they see how nice it is here. I'm standing in the middle of the terraces, which are the residence halls for freshmen and sophomores, where students share these really roomy, bright, modern accommodations. They're so modern, in fact, that the students can go online and check to see if their laundry's done or between classes, they can stop in for some exercise at the Wellness Center, and they may find themselves alongside the school mascot, the Bobcat. Our final piece tonight comes from UC Riverside, where Sunshine LaMontre reports on Jonathan Walton and the intellectuals of hip hop. Every day, Jonathan Walton goes to class to teach about American religious traditions. He's a professor of religious studies at UC Riverside. He's also a self-styled hip-hop intellectual. I actually entered the academic uh, arena so that I could give credence and uh, clarity uh, to the numerous voices of African-American religious people. Great figures like Frederick Douglass and Jarena Lee, uh, 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 Ida B. Wells, and the Prince of the Black Church, Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, the way that they became God-ordained instruments, if you will, for freedom and justice and helped this nation uh, to live up to its uh, sublime ideals and noble principles of freedom, justice, and democracy for all. Uh, they really informed the way that I approach the field of religious studies. I'm a child of the 80s, uh, so thus I'm a product of the deindustrialized spaces of these disillusioned and despaired voices that were able to create artistic exuberance and uh, aesthetic brilliance through this genre called hip hop. When I talk about hip hop, uh, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about the sort of billion dollar uh, focused room corporate industry that is really circulating images uh, around American society and globally actually that really I don't believe and many don't believe really uh, necessarily signify uh, what hip hop is and what hip hop is about. Uh, the masochistic violent uh, dimensions of uh, hip hop that we often see on display, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about the way that in the tradition of great jazz artists, in the tradition of literary figures um, that used artistic production as a form of protest, for people who have been largely denied political access and economic capital, art is resistance, art is a form of protest. Whether we're talking about slaves singing spirituals in the antebellum South, whether we're talking about the courageous cultural reflections in novels of a Ralph Ellison or a Toni Morrison, or whether we're talking about Mahalia Jackson or Aretha Franklin uh, singing the spiritual strivings and articulations of black people. Well, hip hop at its best is an extension of this grand tradition. Oftentimes people think of the black church and hip hop as antithetical, but I don't necessarily see it that way. 
Uh, but yet, when we think about the images that are often deployed in the larger society, particularly coming from the civil rights generation of educated and erudite and well-dressed young men and women on the one hand, and then it seems like hip-hop represents the debase and debaucherous aspects of black progress run amok. Uh, but oftentimes, the two are just part and parcel of a larger grand tradition of using whatever tools uh, can be used to, de to be deployed against the larger society. So what you end up having is, uh, in some ways, hip hop with all of its truncate nature, its homophobia, its sexism, all of its shortcomings. It serves as a mirror to the black church. I often see that when I'm talking to larger groups, that when we think of the KRS-1s and the Chuck D's of the world, it's better to think of them in a larger tradition of the Joan Baez's and the Bob Dylan's and the Pete Seeger's. These artists that were able to ring the alarm, if you will, through their musical production. Uh, these people that were able to rally young forces uh, from their apathy and from their uh, sleep, if you will, in such a way that they're able to raise their consciousness uh, to make them more politically aware and politically astute young people. And so thus we have to give credit and credence to hip hop for doing this in similar ways as generations, white, black, and other that have come before. No matter what your race, no matter your ethnicity, no matter your religious orientation, your gender, or your sexual orientation, I figure we all have uh, a sermon to preach. We all have rhymes to spit. We all have something to contribute to the larger society. And I hope that through my work, uh, our young people will be able to find their own artistic voice. This is Sunshine Lamontry reporting from UC Riverside. I'm back here in the Lantern Cafe again, and the students you can see around me are all preparing for their final exams, which begin today. We wish the very best to the Pioneer class and to all of those students who follow in their footsteps here at UC Merced. That's our program for tonight. Thanks for joining us on State of Minds. I'm Linda Schacht. In the fall, we'll be making a visit to UC Santa Barbara. Until then, good night. <laughs>